Elsewhere, Roanoke County woman says she's standing her ground right in the path of the Mountain Valley Pipeline. Like many pipeline opponents, she has been voicing her criticism of that project. She says developers are taking land and could hurt the environment. She set up a makeshift treehouse hoping to block their progress. 10 News reporter Tommy Lopez has more on her protests. A ways into the woods off Poor Mountain Road on Bent Mountain, a woman is sacrificing access to electricity, heat and running water. She's asked us to call her Red. She's staying 30 feet up, protesting the pipeline's construction that will cross her property, stocked with soup, snacks, and sleeping bags. She says crews called the police yesterday to try to force her down. I'm ready to take on this fight. The 61-year-old is hoping to hold up construction, as plans show the pipeline running through this private property and hers. She says she's going to stay up there as long as it takes. And this is how close she is to these markings that show where a service road is going to come through the property. She's upset, saying the pipeline will harm the environment. I would like to enjoy these woods and not have to wait 200 years for them to grow back. She often voiced her frustration using sarcasm. I no longer have a creek bank, but that doesn't matter because they can make money. And what the hell with my creek bank? Neighbors who also oppose the pipeline came today to say thank you to her. We're very proud of, of what Red's doing and support her 100%. A Mountain Valley spokeswoman says crews have finished cutting down trees under the requirements for the restrictions related to endangering bats, adding, quote, the disruption created by opponents has not changed the overall outcome of the project, which remains on target for a late 2018 in-service. In Roanoke County, Tommy Lopez, 10 News, working for you. Look away, look away, look away. All right, y'all, thank you for tuning in to Dixieland of the Proletariat. We're going to talk about Southern working class history and current events through a leftist perspective. Make sure to like us on social media at Dixieland of the Proletariat or Dixie Prol. And if you want to give your wages to a bunch of rednecks, then subscribe to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash DixieProl. we got a lot of cool stuff to give you, including CDs, stickers, a cookbook, Discord server, Twitch stream, exclusive episodes. We also have a Spotify playlist with some great artists you also check out. And we have a merch store now. Uh, this podcast is brought to you by Camel Silvers, Vaping, Living at Home, Modelo, Pushing People in the Swamps, Tommy's New Obsession with Dr. Phil, and Mountain Valley Pipeline. Shout out to our new Patreon subscribers, Virginia, Rogers, and Myla. Our Patreons, uh, monthly Patreon surplus goes to groups that are run by and or help marginalized folks directly. As always, I'm Nelson. Join with today. Who are we with? Uh, with Ted Krasinski. <laughs> <laughs> Ted Krasinski. And uh, <laughs> my other co-hosts are... John Podesta. John Podesta. <laughs> I'm not playing with y'all no more. <laughs> We got the joke last time. Kai's also here. I am not going to pretend to be some kind of domestic terrorist. Thanks. And our guests this evening are uh, Ted Bundy. Um, no, so uh, <laughs> I was going with the vibe, you know. No, um, I'm going by uh, B today. Yeah. B. And I am B. I was I was trying to come up with a cool a cool nickname, but I couldn't. I can't think of anything. It's all good, y'all. You, you, you guys know. took all the cool names. <laughs> And uh, which organization are y'all with? Appalachian Youth Climate Coalition. Hell yeah. So we're going to talk about the environment today, and we're going to talk about stuff affecting the environment, uh, not just in Appalachia, but also the South, and with that, basically the world. So um, y'all, if, if the platform's y'all, y'alls, and uh, if you want to dive right into talking about issues, so basically, uh, what do y'all do? Who are y'all? Um, go for it. Um, yeah, I guess I can start us off um, and then we can go after and say anything if I missed it. But um, well, first of all, we're a coalition of Appalachian youth. I hope that's pretty clear from our name. Um, but uh, we really focus on we will basically as an organization, we started uh, to try to fill like what we saw was a hole in like the youth, uh, the youth movement, like climate movement and just activism in general. Um, we felt that everything was really focused on big cities and all this, like everything else. Um, and that, you know, organizing in rural spaces um, is very, very different. And so we just kind of struck out on our own. We're like, it's, this is an important space for us. 
So. And yeah, we also want to put uh, an emphasis on intersectionality and different different forms of oppression and different forms of hierarchy within the rural south um it's not just the climate uh, uh, it's not always just the climate um it's never just the climate you know indigenous people they are most affected by you know pipelines go through their land they have the worst water so we always want to we always strive to work with um as many different people as we can as many different groups as we can to ensure that we have an intersectional approach so we're not just one well it's not just a one-way street it's always multi 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 how do you say it multi i trying to think of the word multi-faceted multi there we go yeah we want we want to be multi-faceted like a diamond <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because um, I, I, you, you mentioned that real quick, but it's like, yeah, Appalachia is a lot more diverse than a lot of people like to make it out to be. So, um, yeah. No, the, the, obviously the South is just all white people. It's all the same. It's it's, it's definitely not diverse. It's uh, everyone is uh, racist. Everyone is white, and uh, everyone uh, looks like me and Tyler. Basically, that's it. It's just literally just copies of me and Tyler walking around the entire South. I mean, yeah, it's actually, it literally clones. I think I've seen you. <laughs> Tommy, you're telling me you saw another bald white man with a beard in Appalachia? Are you ever you heard joking? of it before? I was like, they're a dying breed, huh? <laughs> hey, oh, you must be talking about uh, southern Italy, <laughs> an endangered species, if you will. <laughs> Tommy, what were you gonna say? I know you got a joke in there. What? I saw you. You're gonna say something. No, I wasn't going to say anything derogatory about Italians. <laughs> not, <laughs> not right now. Not this time. <laughs> not this time. I had uh, some pizza today, so I'm feeling good. Oh, good, good, good. You've, uh, yeah. you've taken part of my culture. I understand. It's cool. It's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it's not appropriation in that direction. Appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> B, what were you going to say? I was just saying, uh, it's like uh, white people are kind of a minority on this on this episode i oh, guess right yeah thank god nah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's replacement theory gonna be a good one. <laughs> it's about goddamn time what they call it the white genocide oh it's happening <laughs> yep <laughs> they only added me to fill a quota i mean let's be honest <laughs> we now get federal bucks we get federal dollars in because we have a we have, it's half an hour. <laughs> everyone who's ever asked me if i get government money for being native no it all goes to him <laughs> i am so sorry in my past i've said horrible things against white people i want to i i've said that italians are people of color <laughs> forgive me i have <laughs> this is my horrible apology <laughs> i <laughs> You just got Nelson Don't to a T me. right Don't there. Don't cancel me. <laughs> Never apologize for the truth. You can cancel me. <laughs> no. Fucking Look, man. everyone knows. Hey, yo. Everyone knows. It's as I've said before. It's black and Italian people of color. Okay, that's what that's what BIPOC means, and that's that's officially what it means. But anyway, I think you missed one thing. Um, okay, <laughs> I, I know we, we've gotten caught, kind of off track. It's all good. It's all good. It's got to be Italian X. Oh, yeah, you know? definitely. We have, we yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. POC. Oh, yo, it's Italian X. of cannoli. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. my God, yes. 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 Damn, I'm just getting roasted. Oh, man, this is great. Thanks. <laughs> that's, pre that's pretty awesome, y'all. That's some thick shit I haven't heard before. That's fucking great. But, um, all right, so if we're going to, if the, uh, we're going to talk about Appalachia. So, obviously, um, coal mining and the horrible stuff that comes with it. Also, pipelines. So do y'all want to talk a bit about the major issues that are affecting the environment in Appalachia specifically? Uh, sure. I guess I can go again first. I don't want to, I don't want to hog the mic too much, but um, I guess issues that affect Appalachia and the environment, I mean, everything, honestly, um, like everything from, you know, pipelines to, you were saying coal mining to um, just every form of extractive industry. You've got um, heavy industry, you've got um, like military um, manufacturing, stuff like that. Basically everything imaginable, um, I think, is really affecting um, the, the the mountains that we live in. So, lots lots of things that are going um, in uh, around Appalachia, in and around Appalachia. Um, you know, you have the pipelines, the shale, the coal. You have yeah, the the ammunition plants actually like a big one of the biggest ammunition plants in the country is just a few miles away from where I am sitting right now, and it's pumping toxic gas into the uh, river uh, and just upstream of that river actually is a elementary school um so yeah <laughs> lots of lots of horrible things happening 
Yeah, seriously, I don't want to give um, how far exactly we live away from that, but it is um, it's a pretty important issue. So I saw we said it's the, a funny sponsor uh, from the show, the uh, that Mountain Valley Pipeline. Is that a how long has that been going on? Is that like a where exactly is that going to run through? What all could it affect? Like it seems that that's a, a major issue. Like what what is what is the outcome of this? Like what is what's happening with that? Ooh, you said how long? I mean, it's been a minute. Um, I mean, I think they proposed this back in 2015. And I'm gonna let you in on the secret. They um, said they were going to be done with it in 2018. Um, yeah, it's it's great news. Uh, but it, it's going to travel from northern West Virginia, um, all the way across the entire state, um, from like the shale in the northwest Virginia down through um, southwestern Virginia, and then connect to like an even larger pipeline. Uh, so it goes 300 miles up and down um, the mountains and it, uh, it's going to affect drinking water. You know, uh, they, the, the pipeline really sucks at building it. So they've already gotten a lot of like sediment contamination and then all, you know, it just, it's, it's a great time. So, yeah. So with, um, when it comes to, to coal mine, I remember watching some documentaries when we, when we first started the podcast about mountaintop removal. Um, it seems like now, uh, it's just easier for them to just blow up the mountains completely and then just dig out the coal from that. So how devastating uh, is this to the to the environment? Like it seems like just blowing up entire mountains, just completely cutting off the tops is is pretty bad. So like, can you go more into that for people who would not necessarily know anything about that? Yeah, it's actually really devastating because it's not only blowing the top of one singular mountain, it's destroying an entire ecosystem that's based around that 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 one mountain for the thousands of thousands of years because Appalachia is one of the oldest mountain ranges in the world. Um, so one mountain can have so much history and so much diversity that just leveling it can disrupt that in, in oh, thousands and thousands of species of like salamanders, birds, bugs, trees, who knows? Um, and it, it, it's, it's detrimental to the areas around it because where are you going to put all the rubble from the mountain? You're going to dump it on, in the rivers. You're going to dump it in the streams. That causes major problems for, you know, river animals, uh, amphibious animals. Um, and the thing that they do after they're done with mountaintop removal, a lot of times they build prisons on top of that area. The, um, so it's 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 this is why we, you know it's an intersectional approach because you have the environmental part you're blowing the top off of a mountain and then the state comes in and builds a prison on top of that that's like it's so ironic in my opinion um, like they 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 don't even see how it's connected but it, it quite literally and physically is connected. Yeah, I mean it's it's truly devastating. I'm I'm lucky enough not to live like right next to one one of those damn things, but um. You know, you know, we'll, we'll drive through places, um, especially in like central Appalachian, like uh, Kentucky and southern West Virginia. I mean, you can you can look on Google Maps like you don't even need to look for a specific location. Just go anywhere in eastern Kentucky or southern West Virginia, scroll, find a mountain, zoom in. Um, and chances are you'll see just like a giant um, area that's like almost like a desert because they just blew the whole thing up. Uh, and it's, it's really terrible because in the past, you know, they were using like actual like underground mines, but now that they've taken so much of the coal now it's easier for them just to like blow the whole thing up and it uses you know less people um, they don't have to pay as many workers and, <laughs> and honestly yeah it's a lose 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 situation it's it's really it's crazy yeah and i um uh, i just want to touch one more thing about the prison thing i just looked it up and as of july 2019 the u.s bureau of prisons had withdrawn 500 million dollars for an expansion of mountaintop prisons so it is crazy what they're doing not only with the mountaintops but that devastation is going to last for generations now if you're not trying to rebuild if you're trying to make it worse with like racism and the carceral state that i had no i think i, don't, I think i speak for everybody i had no idea they were like stripping these mountains and building prisons on top of them that's insane it's just like salt in the wound like you've already destroyed the environment and now you're going to put a symbol of racist capitalism on top of it it's just it's it's fucking wild um, back to the pipeline, this, uh, so what, so y'all's coalition is involved, but what has been the, what has been the major thing to try to stop this? Like what has been, what has been done? What have y'all done? What have other groups that y'all are in coalition with done to, to stop, to stop this and bring attention to 
this pipeline that's going to run through this beautiful uh, area? Well, I mean, we cannot talk about this without mentioning the elephant tree sitters. Like, those are the most badass people that I have ever seen in my entire life. Um, <laughs> they they literally uh, were they had folks in trees in platforms 50 feet in the air um, for 932 days. It wasn't the same people, obviously, but, you know, it, they had folks up there for a long, long, long time. And that's one of the major reasons. Like I said earlier, they were supposed to finish in 2018. Now they're like, I think t- twice their budget. Um, they're over budget and they're behind. Uh, and yeah, t- <laughs> they're one of the major reasons why. So this is that, what was the name of the organization again? And they've, and that's basically hindered. Like, is it, has the pipeline stopped? Is it, is it, are they going to continue? Obviously there's um, millions and millions of dollars obviously invested in this thing. So uh, has it stopped? Has it hindered it? Has it like, what else, what's the situation as of today? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's hindered it, but the, the actually it's kind of, kind of unfortunate recently. So they actually, they actually um, extracted them. Um, I think it was like in, February or something. Um, and currently the tree sitters are sitting in jail and they will be in jail for another couple of months. Um, but they, they ended up, they ended up cutting down the trees there and all that. So there's no trees left on the, on the path, but they were able to delay it for a really, really, really long time. Cause <laughs> it was so funny watching the cops go there over and over, scratching their heads, trying to figure out how the hell they were going to get them down off of that, like steep, steep, steep slope. So this is pretty satisfying to watch. You know, before um, y'all came on here, I was looking into this and I had just seen that um, some of the tree sitters had been sentenced to stay in prison for as long as they hindered the pipeline themselves. So like one of them had another few months and uh, another one had quite a a bit longer sentence. But um, yeah, that's something that you see in a lot of like a pipeline protests is the best way that you can do this is to drain the money out of it by stopping it for as long as you can and attacking the the investors who aren't getting any return on their investments so um yeah all the power to them that's not an easy thing to do to put your body on the line these are the people who are really really down for the cause fucking a that is tight as fuck you know who else was down for the cause <laughs> ted kaczynski <laughs> uh, yeah he was really down he was really really down, really down for the cause oh my god and he put his body and other bodies on the line. Like, yeah, come on. The tree sitters are actually, they remind me, like, they're reminiscent of uh, the Ewoks from Star Wars. You know, they have their little platforms in the trees, and then you have the Empire with their Death Star, or whatever, Death Star 2, I think it was. Um, and, you know, it's like a symbol of resistance, sadly. It's down now, but who knows? Like, in the end, like Star Wars, the good guys always win, so... <laughs> I mean, y'all think we're kidding about the Ewok thing, actually. We, it's been a running joke. They're, the only thing that's left in the trees right now, like the, the tree sets are done, but there is a legitimate, what we call it the Ewok bridge. It's between two trees. There's a platform, like a path they use to travel between two of them. It's made out of wood. It looks exactly like it came out of Star Wars. So no, I mean, <laughs> legitimately, uh, they, are, they are the Ewoks. And it's just fun. Do you have pictures of these? Can you, can you send those to us? I really want to see them. We could probably find them, yeah. Yeah. Uh, not sure off the top of my head, but yeah, we could definitely get them. Too. That'd be pretty dope. I was, I was thinking more of the Lorax, but yeah, the start the Ewoks are definitely good. It's like I'm the Lorax that speaks for the trees. <laughs> they just like start just like picking off the uh, the people working on the pipeline. There are a few very 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 few canonical like indigenous held things when it comes to pop culture, and for one of those, the Ewoks are indigenous. All right, they're us. So <laughs> you can keep your your fucking Lorax with his blonde mustache. <laughs> It would have been so badass if they had just started throwing logs just from their perches in the trees, just started throwing the logs at the cops, just be like, take that, take that. And that would have that would have made it ten times. It would have been yeah. completely illegal and they would have been charged with They so should have much cut the more, trees down with them inside and they'd been like, all right, well, so badass. All these hippies. Oh man. Um, I mean, I have this isn't confirmed, but um, I I heard one of them dumped a bucket of piss on cops that were trying to remove them. So like, I, it's basically the same thing in my mind. Fuck yeah. So. <laughs> Hell yeah! I hope it was old and stale. I hope it was like day one piss. It's like Just brown stale. and icky. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. That dehydrated piss. But all right, y'all. So it's in the name. It's a coalition. So what other the you have the the people that sit in the trees, the Ewoks. Um, who else do y'all work with? So just like if you, um, 
it seemed like uh, if there's a coalition, it's just like we want to get we want to give shout outs. We want like other people to know like it's not just y'all, but there's a there's there's a a number of people that are involved in this because this is a this is a big undertaking. We can talk about you know our involvement with Sunrise and like other youth groups. I do want to point out that it's not like the Treesters are part of our organization. But I mean, we definitely do work a lot with them because um, we're really more focused on youth. I would say, yeah, definitely majority of our of the members of our organization, um, which we don't really have official members, but um, a lot of our most of our organizers are actually like under eighteen. So, um, so the, the Zoomers yeah. really are rising up. So this is like a Zoomer thing. <laughs> Gen Z <laughs> for real, yeah, represent. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, it's it's not, I was actually talking about this the other day with a few folks. Um, it was weird to have the word coalition. Um, we were thinking of renaming it potentially in the future. Um, so that was, a, that was a part of it, like, is it a coalition or is it not? But yeah, we certainly do collaborate with uh, other groups in the region. Uh, Sunrise is an example. Um, we collaborate with Sunrise when it comes to urban um, actions like when it comes to if we want to do a big city if we want to do a rally there if we want to whatever um, they're really great with that um, yeah so uh, in what way do you actually mobilize other young people who the way that the American system is set up that if you're under 18 you're kind of disenfranchised and having a political voice and all that so how do you actually work with young people who can't they can't do that you should just go vote it out you know that kind of thing I think one of the actually the, the, the good things, the, the beauty of youth organizing is that like we can't vote, you know, like we can't um, for a lot of folks, we can't like they don't have that to pretend like they're doing something. You know what I'm saying? Um, they can be like, oh, well, I just voted. That's it. And it's, we're kind of forced to be creative. Um, we're, we're, we're forced to really dig deep and try to figure out ways that we can influence things. I mean, a lot, a lot of the people in the organization can't even drive yet. So it is it is like. <laughs> It is like we're trying to figure out, like, okay, how do we do this? I mean, it is a whole different ball game than a lot of other groups. So, yeah, a lot of it's personal. Um, like we, we all, a lot of our organization, organization goes to the same schools. We go to the same, you know, areas. We are all like a whole organization is a one big friend group. Basically, it, it does have its downsides. Like some of our meetings are never productive because it's it just turns into a into a gossip fest. Like we are just like blah, 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 blah. okay. Um, but yeah, it, it is a personal thing. It's easier, I think, when you're young to recruit your friends. You know, you're just like you see them in the hallway. You're walking like, hey, come on, uh, join us. Uh, we're doing a rally on Wednesday or whatever. You know. I remember when I was young. Yeah, I do want to. <laughs> Reminiscing, huh? I, I do want to point out that it's not like I definitely V you didn't mean this, uh, but I do want to point out that it's not like just you know one friend group. Um, because I every mean, we do we have organized we have organizers in multiple states, like that's um, and the reason I like I I would I'm careful about this is because a lot of people are really quick to um kind of like blow us off, blow off youth organizers, and that's like I'm like every fucking word, you know. I mean, are we allowed to cr- cuss on this podcast? Oh, my bad. No, <laughs> I never. No, I don't no cursing. <laughs> yeah, no fucking cursing, y'all. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I just, don't listen to Tommy. <laughs> you know, you just, you just don't you listen just to either of them. Like, yeah, if you're doing more than one thing, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just yeah make that clear because people are like, oh, it's just one friend group. That no, nah, no, nah, we did not mean that. We are be taken seriously. I mean, like, it, I think now, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, no, y'all are not. You're not. You're not. You're not talking to boomers here. Like, we we all grew up with the internet. We understand like how like you know. Kai is in in the UK and like we met over the internet so it's like one of those things where like when you say one friend group like our millennials and the zoomer generation like we're used to making friends and having really good communications and actually sometimes never ever meeting face to face so no we we got you the rest of us hosts are a generation older than you we're all millennials i mostly mm-hmm. i think nah. i think <laughs> But do you do you think that I'm definitely a millennial? <laughs> okay. Do you think that um, your age and the way that you've had to interface with the world and the way that you've had the internet with you all this time has impacted the way that you can create these coalitions and that you can you have so much scope on the world and the the amount of problems that we have with the environment that it has made it easier? Has it made it harder? Um, do you get to like grow your groups this way? Uh, yeah, um, I don't want to keep talking first, I guess. But, um, you know, I guess it, this is a little bit, 
I, I think I think a lot of our generation, probably millennials too. I mean, first of all, get the fuck out of here with y'all skinny jeans and all that. Um, but uh, how the fuck? But, uh, <laughs> God damn! <laughs> Sorry, that was a low blow. Man. But um, I think it's like. I, we operate a lot on dark humor, you know, it's like, cause every day there's like another worldwide crisis and you're like, Oh crap. Um, and I think that that kind of is, that is first of all, really mobilizing, but also it does, I don't know. It, it does give this, this, it give it this, like, um, it, it does kind of make it a little bit easier in some sense. Cause it's like, you know, if, if they're not convinced by, you know, the global pandemic, uh, then maybe they'll be convinced by the fascist storming of the White House. I mean, not White House, Senate, uh, Congress, Congress building. And you know, if they're not, the White House, pretty much, <laughs> same thing, right? No, but yeah, it, it does make it easier in some ways and also harder in some ways because it's like, oh, there's more things to deal with. But yeah, yeah, I, I think uh, when it comes to us as millennials, um, we were kind of one of the first generations where it's like, oh, everything's shit constantly. And then, you know, uh, the the younger generation, like it's it's always like that. You pretty much never had a time where there was where things were like generally okay or you felt like things are generally okay. Um, just from the amount of information that you can have now. You know, you never had that that helpful like ignorance, you know, that that older generations would have had. Um so yeah, I, I can like one of the things that I, I really love about watching like in, indigenous people and indigenous youth do this is that um, they are a, quite a powerful force that they're they're getting ready to do these things so early and they're ready to tackle it. And um, yeah, I just I'm really in awe of y'all. Like you you're so much more advanced than I was around because your my, age. My- big thing was like, like Appalachia is a huge region, like in multiple states. It's just like, if y'all are coordinating things in multiple areas, like you have to be in touch and in communication a lot. It seems like, cause if you, I didn't know, uh, like you have the rural aspect, like you're saying, but if you also have protests in like urban areas, so it's two different beasts really when you're attacking these things. So, um, I guess the next, the next thing would be like, what are some, what are some, uh, what are some things that y'all have been able to achieve? Like we, we hype on the negative stuff, like the, the pipeline, but we did, that is being halted. So what are some other, like, I guess, issues and in, in wins that y'all can uh, chalk up to actually getting out there and doing direct action? Yeah. Um, one of our really close partners, um, uh, they recently just succeeded in passing a, oh, what was it? A revision of a local client. Well, I don't, what was it? Climate, climate commitment, commitment yeah. Climate, yeah, climate commitment. There we go. Um, where it was like the declaration of a climate emergency, carbon neutrality by 2030, was it? 2035, I believe. Something, something like that. Um, that was a huge thing because it was like one of the first first times ever in a southern Virginia or like rural area that's ever happened. So that was that was amazing. Um yeah. That, that's that's one yeah i mean that was that was that was really cool especially because uh it was after it was like almost two years of just continuous organizing from like a bunch of different people and some of our some of our organizers actually helped draft that it was with um a university um somewhere in appalachia um i guess in, in southwest virginia um but yeah that was probably our biggest win and then also i think another thing is just you know getting the word out and mobilizing we, i mean we can talk about specific actions too, but yeah, that was probably yeah one of the biggest things. Yeah, if you don't mind, you want to go into more like specific actions. It seems like it's like uh, I know there's a, there's a big issue, so this obviously like if you want to go into specific actions, please by all means. Uh, yeah, um, we have we did do uh, a series of direct actions in support of the tree sitters. I think it was in no sometime early late 2020. Those were pretty successful. Um, we've done a lot of direct actions about a lot of different issues. We have been able to garner a lot of public support in our area. I think that was very, very helpful to our, I, I know it's going to be very helpful to our future plans to have symp- a sympathetic public, um, to our cause. Like you don't want to operate in an area where people are hostile to you. You want to operate in an area where people walk down the street and they go like, yeah, or they honk their horn or whatever, you know, that, that, that uplifts you that makes you uh want to fight more because you know people are on your side uh yeah yeah and i guess some like specific exa- like examples um we do a lot of banner drops that's one thing we found that's really accessible for youth is because like you know you can get a couple of people 
a um, couple of buddies together and like people can, you can make a banner in one day and just go out somewhere and hang it really quick. Um, and it, yeah, it, it, we, it is very, that is one of the things that, um, so if you're like a, a high schooler or somebody listening to this, you don't even need a car for that kind of thing. Um, and it's, it should be pretty low risk. So just some quick advice for that. Uh, we also do like just standard rallies um, and we're trying to get into some more radical shit, but um, that's not quite yet happening. But yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Ted Bundy, um, what, um, I guess my, 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 my next thing, next question would be what's been the pushback? Like obviously the police and the mining companies and the pipeline people, but like, uh, have you found, where all have you all gotten pushback from? Because obviously there's people that are not going to give a shit and they're going to be on the other side. Yeah, the pushback usually comes from people like the authority, like um, the university uh, president, um, the police, the pipelines, school systems. Those are usually the areas we find have the most pushback. It's places that you know hold the power, because so obviously they're not they're not ready to get give up that power. Um, so the public has been pretty sympathetic. We've had a few run-ins with. Some uh, libertarian esque folks at our direct actions, but I, I don't. I say libertarian esque because they pretend to be libertarian. They like carry the Gadsden flag. Don't tread on me. While their land is literally being treaded on by the Mountain Valley Pipeline, it's it's so ironic. Um, but there's not been. I don't. I I personally haven't seen. It's probably there has been. I haven't seen. But the public has usually been sympathetic to uh, the cause. Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, a lot of us are like literal children. So it's kind of it's a little bit harder to be angry at like literal children uh, a lot of times. Another thing is um, obviously there's a more uh, like pretty much every event. I feel like there's at least one like asshole that comes by and just flips us off with like his MAGA, you know, flag or something. Um, but, you know, contrary to what a lot of, um, you know, a lot of liberals, a lot of uh, northern folks would say, is that I, I'm, in my experience, at least most average people are at least somewhat receptive to this. As long as you don't go up and be like, um, talk like Democrats do, you know, you just talk like normal people about normal issues that you're both facing, you know, uh, most people seem to be sympathetic for these kinds of things. It's like, oh, I mean, who would have guessed that a lot of people like human rights, you know, who would have guessed that a lot of people you know, enjoy not living next to a bunch of pressurized explosives in a pipeline, you know, it's that kind of thing. As an organization, we really try to, one of our main points is to meet people where they are, you know, um, and that really helps with communication. But obviously with the, you know, the, the people that are out there, out there, there's really not much you can do. Yeah, I, I feel like that would be something that a lot of uh, outside listeners would be surprised by, that there wouldn't be a lot of push back from your general population as I, f I feel like people have this idea that the south and appalachia is full of reactionaries who will only submit to you know government authority at this point like it's some weird twisting of history and and who the people who live there what they're actually like um so yeah i think i think that's something that people would be surprised to hear that you you can meet people so easily and not have that much pushback from your average person. However, I will say the libertarians, like the libertarians, like the ones that are like, don't tread on me. Yeah, they, they, they're like no authority except for the authority I like, <laughs> you know? So. No authority that oppresses me, but I'm fine with authority that oppresses others. <laughs> exactly. A really, a really good example of that on both uh, what you two were both talking about, um, just uh, the idea of you know, just like average people, you know, being average people, you know, um, a lot of uh, multiple times. I mean, I've seen um, folks with like a Trump sign in their yard, but then they also have a new pipeline sign in the yard. So it kind of I think it kind of shows that, you know, despite all the, you know, right wing propaganda and all the, you know, all the branding with the. Confed I mean, yeah, there was one I, one one house I saw had a Confederate flag and a no pipeline sign, you know. Um, I think that's kind of an indicator that even though a lot of folks have been kind of been swept up in this branding and this, you know, you know, um, macho, you know, right wing saber rattling. But really, I think a lot of folks just deep down are just, you know, they want to do the right thing. Um, and that's a good indicator of that, in my opinion. Yeah. And there's been a history of uh, in Appalachia of leftist socialist out. Oh. It's, I, I'm, I'm sure all of you guys know, um, there has been a deep, deep history since the 
since the 19th century uh, and the discovery of coal in Appalachia. Um, interesting fact, actually, in during a period in the 30s, just before the Depression and in that time, the, there was over 50% of West Virginian mayors were members of the Communist Party. That blew my mind. Because when you think of West Virginia, you usually think of, you know, Trump 2020, you know, uh, black back of the blue, whatever. Um, but there is a deep history of leftist uh, solidarity here. And I think if you if you actually talk to the people here, it's not that that history hasn't totally gone away. There certainly has been a resurgence of, you know, conservatism and reactionaries. Um, but that that history is way deeper than anything like than anything Trump has to, has done. To this area like that will always persist in my opinion yeah and over time we're spending a lot of time in this talk but i just want to say one more thing um about um i mean obviously in appalachia in the south there are i mean i'm not going to deny there are pockets of like really really racist folks um but also one other example is i mean really recently and this was concerning but there is a there's a proud boy banner um like in around where we live um but it got taken down really, really quickly by uh, a lot of the organizers we work with. I mean, that's, I think, kind of the encouraging thing is that, you know, despite all the, you know, the, on the news and on like just the media in general talking about how scary it is. Um, and I mean, it is serious, but also like we outnumber their banner like 20 to one, you know, just our group of teenagers alone. I think that's, that says a lot um, about who's really making, getting, getting stuff done. So. Y'all are blowing my fucking mind. Like, at, y- at, at, at y'all's age, like, like, I was the most unproductive fucking person. Like, <laughs> like all I thought about was getting, like, fucked up and just uh, complete, nothing. Like, I was, there was no sense of, like, any kind of, like, I had no political idea on who I was. I didn't give a shit. Like, it just blows my mind. Fucking, you just say kids are fucking something else. It's wild. You can thank her. Thank the technological revolution. We we love technology. <laughs> what what radicalized y'all? Well, that is an interesting story. I'll, I'm I'm gonna go as fast as I can. But um, my actually great grandpa was a revolutionary in India who fought against British, uh, the British crown because uh, they were a colony of the British. So he fought, he was arrested by the, the damn redcoats. He was arrested twice uh, by the British and he was jailed. But, you know, he eventually, he succeeded and India became independent. Um, so that that radical lineage has stayed in my family for a while. Um, uh, and we moved uh, to the States, uh, but we, we still haven't given up that radical identity because, you know, India was oppressed for like hundreds of years. Uh, so that kind of generates a sense of, well, we're oppressed. We have to fight against the oppressors, and that's inherently radical. Uh, v, real quick, I hate to break this to you, but uh, Tommy is actually a redcoat. Uh, he's a, he's a loyal British subject. Oy. Well, I am. Actually, I don't want to say this, but I am actually a redcoat as well. I am a Canadian citizen, so I don't I don't know if that makes me. A, I, I can say I'm partially a redcoat because you know, not not totally, not not a. Don't take on the oppressors, the oppressors' clothes. I'm over here taking back the land and the on behalf of my people. This is Indian land I'm here. Not, I'm not a hundred percent full blood redco. I can, I can, I can reclaim that part of my heritage. I can say I'm a quarter redco. I can. So y- y'all, you and Tommy are on the same team. <laughs> what's what's all this? This is Sunday, Nick. <laughs> And what's that meme? It's Tuesday, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. it's, Tuesday. It's, Tuesday, isn't it? it's Tuesday, isn't it? It's Tuesday. Oh man. Uh if anybody wants to hear those kind of jokes, all you have to do is join our Patreon to get on our Discord, play Jackbox games with us, and that is all you're gonna hear for about two hours. I think it's actually the good Lord Sunday. Uh I think we oh. should all be in church, actually. Um we are all very sinful people <laughs> so we, we should probably go to church uh, I, yeah, be yeah it's, it's kind of it's kind of funny um i doubt there's that oh actually no never mind there are hold on I, this will make sense in a minute i promise um so my i'm actually also descended from communists um 
uh, my uh, grandparents um, were, are they they are they they were from China um, and um, uh, no not from China they they lived there their entire life I don't know what I'm saying but they were both they were both uh, they both like you know joined the Communist Party um, they were both a part of that and I mean as much uh, the funny thing is is I actually was like until recently I was really 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 anti you know I kind of saw that as like um, a bad thing. Um, because, you know, my mom immigrated here and there, there are obviously problems, but, um, I, my point is also that like, even though it does kind of sound like, oh, you know, uh, me and V are all, like both descended from communists. So I guess that makes sense why we're actually doing this stuff. But also if you think about it, a lot of Appalachians, a lot of Southerners are also probably descended from communists. Like, I mean, talk about the battle of Blair mountain, you know, the Harlan County cold wars. I mean, those are some badass people that who's like, I guess, grandkids great grandkids are now waving the MAGA flag right um and so I mean it does it, it, I think it speaks volumes about how much like you know leftist heritage and and how deep it really runs despite you know everybody trying to um erase it um yeah and I guess specific events that radicalized me um I guess I can get into that a little bit I mean just seeing the um seeing the the, the pipeline was a big one seeing the like the kind of desert the path that it that that it struck um, was was a really big moment. So, yeah, a specific one for me was actually seeing Bernie Sanders when he was cheated out of the nomination uh, by the Democratic Party. That kind of you know which time the, uh, the second time that kind of I think it was it's been fourteen months almost to the day that Super Tuesday twenty twenty that 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 was the day that I I vowed never to trust the Democratic Party again. Um, after they cheated him out, I'm like, okay, I know what happened in 2016. Maybe maybe just, just one time, can we please have a crumb of hope? But no, no, everybody drops out and he's screwed. So. It's just, it's really funny listening to that younger generation say we're radicalized them and like we all remember like a post 9-11 world and like a, like a, no, a pre 9-11 world then a post 9-11 world and like how all that shit just fucking hit the fan. Like Tommy and I, and Kai too, Brian Tyler, baby, like we had a military recruiters always coming to our high school to try and recruit us to fucking go to war in Iraq. And it's like, ah, how about not? There's a, uh, the, the army right now is giving away a free pair of AirPod Pros with oh, every shit. enlistment. That's not even a joke, is it? That's real. Yeah, yeah I'm totally down. No, that's, that's real as fuck. Tommy, let's go. That's real as fuck. Like I will, uh, <laughs> This is this is what happens yep. when you commercialize commercialize every part of everything. You get <laughs> that's like that's like they're fucking. They have a the, I want to say it's the Navy has like an esports Twitter account oh and like an God. esports team. Like yeah, when when I was in high school, uh, this was right at the beginning of kind of the escalation of the Iraq war. So we would have recruiters. We had a, we had a big open common area in my high school and they'd have recruiters come in driving the most like just tricked out Hummer into the common area. And they would set up um, gaming rigs in the back of it to have kids come play on the gaming rigs so that the recruiters could talk to them while they were doing it. Uh, yeah. There's a long history of that. Yeah. And let me go ahead and say 9-11 fucking ruin country music because after that God, fucking toby yes. keith dropped this shitty fucking song just listen like, to tom seeger man uh, you know you know it's it's gotta <laughs> it's still good good like country music now um but uh it, it's uh it's funny that you should talk about the um uh the military recruiters because they i mean i've seen them so many times actually uh we had, we had a similar story at my school um one time, and this was like kind of before I was radicalized, they came in, they had like a bunch of weights, you know, and they were like, who can lift the most? Ah! Toxic masculinity, patriarchy. Yeah, yeah, they were like, they were beating that toxic masculinity. And then um, a bunch of like the, the guys were like, yeah, I, yeah, I can lift the most, like, yeah. Um, but the funny thing is, is that I actually didn't think twice about it. I was like, oh, normal, you know? Which is kind of really sad if you think about it, um, how normalized that is. I just, I, I do, I think it's kind of an important thing to think about. Yeah. So my, uh, when, uh, so our first episode actually was on coal mining in West Virginia and Kentucky and the Battle of Blair Mountain and the history of coal mining. Um, when I, what we watched some documentaries about it, and the one thing that really stuck out was uh, 
since you had like kind of the death of the labor movement and like mining be one of the very few industries that is somewhat unionized, but it's still just a shell of its former self that the, that the, the, um, the people fighting against the coal companies tended to be more like environmental activists. And you kind of see the union miners kind of pitted between the activists and the companies. And you saw like the union activists or the union members getting upset at the environmentalists because their fear is that the mines will get shut down and they'll lose their jobs. So my question is, is like, have y'all seen that? Um, how would you respond to that? Like if, if I remember listening to one guy is probably roughly my age and not a bit younger, he was like, you know, well, the Democrats don't understand is like, if you close these mines, we just, we have nothing to, we have nowhere to go. It's like a, you can't take a coal miner that's making 30, $40 an hour or whatnot, a good union job and ask him to go work at McDonald's for 10 bucks an hour. And it's one of those things like, how do you, how do you combat that? Like, how do you try to reckon, not, I want to say reconcile, but like if someone were to say like, Hey, I agree what you're saying, but I can't lose my job. I guess if you all run into that. Yeah, I think that's, that's come out of the separation from the economy and the environment. That's really what's driving this in my opinion. Um, cause you really can't separate the economy from the environment. The economy is what's driving the destruction of the environment in the first place. Um, it's, it has been really detrimental to the movement as a whole, the division between um, the workers and the environmentalists, because the environmentalists tend to be, you know, wealthy, um, white liberals from the north. And it, it's not a good look if you have these people coming down and telling the workers who are like um, being exploited by the uh, the capitalists, uh, what to do. Um, but there hasn't really been that economic framework of policy connecting climate to the environment until uh, climate, <laughs> climate to the environment, climate to the economy until now. Um, there, the recently there's like, you know, the green new deal, uh, it's connecting, you know, you, you slowly in a staged process, you like phase out fossil fuels, but then at the same time you increase infrastructure in like solar wind um it's based off you know um fdr's new deal policy uh there were no jobs um after the stock market crash and what did fdr do he built the hoover dam he started the civilian corps um he did all this stuff so the creation of jobs for environmental specific problems like imagine the amount of jobs we can create if we were to switch the entire nation to uh renewable energy like who is going to build the wind uh, the turbines who's going to build the rails who is going to build whatever you know that 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 generates a lot of jobs and if we negotiate through like a leftist policy we can get lots of good paying union jobs um obviously it's not ideal because it is working within a capitalist framework uh, ideally we wouldn't have jobs and wages but that that is a that is a it's a it's a type of rebuttal to that, to that particular argument yeah to that point um because i think it's kind of really one of the most important things about our organization is trying to be that communicator really quick i also want to correct myself i think i said tom seeger i don't know where the hell that came from pete seeger is pete seeger that's that's really embarrassing um <laughs> it's like i feel like i should to get that right because it's important um but also i think it's really important to recognize how you know how much propaganda there has been around that and how how much like warp the media narrative is uh you know it's like oh it's the environmentalists versus the um the coal miners um and in a lot of ways like v said there is a fundamental disconnect like with the issues of class but also it's also important to recognize um that there are, you know, a lot of instances of solidarity and there are um, a lot of ways that you can try to c connect that and reconcile that. One thing um, that we really try to do as an organization is to make sure that we don't, you know, say buzzwords that are going to be, you know, prop like that have been propagandized over and over. Because a lot of folks, if you go up and say Green New Deal, they immediately think about like, oh, no more hamburgers, you know, no more cows. You know, you gotta, you gotta, <laughs> this is a sidetrack funny story, but we were in um, Richmond for this action uh, with Sunrise last year. And as we were leaving the building, um, this lady yelled at us like, oh, you know, you got all y'all environmentalists, 
you, you're gonna next thing you know you gotta plug your butts too and i was like wait um but i mean that just kind of goes to show how deep that propaganda runs and i mean you tune into radio stations you tune into like the tv um a lot of these like conservative you know outlets they have it on lock uh, so it's important to not go up to someone and say green new deal green new deal in order not to say socialism socialism um, and obviously, you know, you don't want you, the goal here. I want to make it clear is we're not, we're not lying to people. You know, the, we, what we're just doing is reframing the language in order to be something that's not going to trigger an immediate response. So instead of saying like green new deal jobs guarantee, be like, well, if there's work to be done, you know, look at the infrastructure, look at the crumbling bridges and roads, right? There's work to be done. So why aren't we doing it? You know, why aren't there people doing the jobs? Why are there people that are just sitting in poverty because they can't, they supposedly can't get jobs when there's work to be done and be like, well, what if, if the coal jobs go away, you know, clearly stuff needs to happen. So why don't we just do it? Um, and it's the same thing. It's literally the same exact thing, except you're kind of sidestepping Tucker Carlson, Tucker Carlson, you know, not letting them get to them first. <laughs> so, yeah. I think that language of meeting people where they are is very valuable. Um, this is a story from my dad. He was, uh, getting our car fixed actually and he had he was shuttling back from the place because he didn't have his car obviously because it was getting fixed so he was shuttling back and the bus driver he was the only one on the bus and the bus driver was this like old white guy who said his first job was apparently working on the railway telegram which i have no idea what that is or when that was i don't know how where when i don't know um it's, it sounds old certainly it sounds really old the telegram uh he actually my dad started talking to him and my dad starts talking uh so he's a very um the guy the bus driver was apparently a very you know kind of christian guy he's like yeah and he's like oh and then oh my you know jesus i put my trust in jesus i went to church i do this i do that so my dad starts talking about yeah and you know jesus uh said it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go to heaven and talking through the framework of people and where they are um, and what they believe in it does help because he started talking about you know jesus and equality and christianity and how christianity at its core is a type of a philosophy of equality it's been corrupted certainly by lots of different people but if you talk like that it's certainly helpful you can talk about how jesus was uh, what wanted equality for everybody not not just uh, white people not just evangelicals yeah i tried to look up that real, it, I couldn't find it on Google to see like how long. That just sounds like an old thing. That just might have been like the crib keeper fucking driving this bus. <laughs> Zombie. I think they're too young to know oh, who the crib keeper is. <laughs> oh yeah, true. God. Oh man. Um, I just want to say, uh, Tommy and Tucker Carlson are actually really good friends. So uh, we can't talk bad yeah, about best them. friends. Best friends. My bad. Friends of the show. But, friends, but, uh, okay. friends, of the show. <laughs> friends of the show. Tucker Carlson. But uh, what I was gonna say is. Um, Back to, you know, you were talking about the Trump signs next to the no pipeline signs and uh, all of the, basically, it shows you that, that Democrats just don't give a shit about winning because if they did, you know, populism wins. People don't, people care about the issues that directly affect them. And if you make a better life for the working class, then you will get elected every time over and over. But they just don't care about winning. They just care about fundraising. Yeah, the, they, yeah. They, the Republicans and the Democrats, they chose two different routes. They're both two different heads of the same system, but, you know, the Democrats blatantly have no no care for anything. The Republicans at least try try to make it seem like that's why the working class in Appalachia, sometimes the Republican Party is appealing because they, they use the language of populism and we're not going to do anything, but we're going to talk like we actually care about your job, we actually care about your family, we actually care about your religion or your churches or whatever, but we don't. We just want your money so we can, you know, buy an island in the Bahamas or whatever. We de uh, definitely need more Joe Manchin. Seems like Joe Manchin seems to be the, the, yes. the way to go when it comes to the winning <laughs> ticket. <laughs> Actually, um, one thing that I meant to say, that was actually the first thing, my f first thing that popped in my head when we were talking about how do you talk to people and like, how do you, you know, um, go against like the resistance that that is kind of just put in people's heads by Fox News and all that. Um, is to just say fuck the Democrats as like often as possible. 
because I mean, I don't know how many times people have just assumed that we are like hardcore liberals, you know? Um, and the thing is, the thing is, we're not, we're definitely not conservatives. That's for damn sure. But um, just, you know, that if there's like any one thing that I can say that's helped me the most when like talking to people or just, you know, trying to get the message out in general um, for those listening, it's just to say fuck the Democrats too, because they, a lot of times people think that you're on their side, but really we're not. Um, yeah. I just think that's a really important thing. When in doubt, shit on libs. <laughs> that's what the podcast is all about. Uh, yeah. we're, we're actually paid for by the DNC. The DNC actually finances this podcast. <laughs> So uh, move over, move over, Pod Save America, Dixieland, the proletariat's coming for you. <laughs> they're called, that's why they're called lib charts because you shit on the lips, obviously. You know, lib charts. I should clarify. He said lib sharks. We had that lib not, not, yeah. not, not the, not the slur. We, we, yeah, no, it just the audio sounded weird. I just, it's I'm paranoid about that. Um, uh, we, we've but, had, we've had worse audio come on. Trust me. Oh shit. <laughs> Um, so, uh, what, it, what, what can we do to, um, to help you guys? Like what can us and our listeners do to help con- contribute to this cause and to what you can, yeah. The old folks. What can Nelson as a boomer. Listen, y'all do? can get your asses out on the line too, but uh, I do want to hear their answer. Dude, dude. My back hurts. I think actually, um, one thing that is, I mean, something that everyone can do no matter where you are is just, just never underestimate people, even if they're like really, really young. Um, I mean, I've had, I've talked to like, I mean, literally, I mean, actually recently a middle school group from North Carolina came to learn, I mean, like or a group of middle, middle, middle school aged kids came to talk to us. I mean, they were like 13, you know, never underestimate kids. They were, they, we were learning from them about consensus decision making. You know, I, that is, that is the, a really, really big thing I want to stress is that age in this situation really does not have anything to do with how knowledgeable people are. It's just, yeah, don't, don't underestimate young people and encourage them. That's what I'd say. God damn you fuckers are wild. Boomers rise up. God damn it. I'm so fucking mad. I'm so fucking old. These kids are smart as shit. Todd, you're the youngest one on the podcast. <laughs> God damn. Yeah, you are. I know. So y'all, y'all can feel work. No, look, look, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to my fellow millennials here. You don't have to pit us being dumb compared to these youth groups who are doing these things. You can learn from them just as much. You can put your asses on the line when they can't, you can do these things. Don't just be mad about it. Do something about it. Yeah. Stop watching the office. Yes, please. Just get out and do just something. Stop. Just stop watching the office. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh God. When it gets in the fucking social media and it's just like, Anyway, shut long, the fuck up, Nelson. Long, you watch The Sopranos. Yeah, first off, The shit. Sopranos is much better than The Fucking Ooh, Office. Oh, it's my oh, ass. I, I disagree. The Office was pretty tight. The Office sucks. The Office is like. Ugh. Listen to the Zoomers, Nelson. They run shit. No, I'm sorry. I, Zoomers are Zoomers are discovering The Sopranos and liking it. But anyway, The Sopranos is just Office for fucking Italian people. Hey, yo, 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 yo. <laughs> it is. It's the Italian Office. Yeah. <laughs> I hate you. So much right now. You know how each country has their own <laughs> office. That's that's the office, Italy. That's I don't think we should be uh, supporting racism on this podcast, especially racism towards the marginalized Italian American. <laughs> <laughs> yes, fuck that. Yeah, I, yes! fuck that. They, I they stand invented Italian fascism. Right. They invented fascism. <laughs> fuck the Italians. Tyler, just because you don't know what you are doesn't mean you can't like shit on everyone else. All right. I'm so- a- uh, I mean, I traced it back recently. I'm, I'm part Arcadian. The fuckers fucking who came here from fucking... Tommy is just crying laughing. <laughs> you, mean, do you mean Arcadians? Like, Arcadians or Arcadians? No, Arcadians. We, we, like, from arcades, like... <laughs> like... Jesus Christ. <laughs> here I am as an indigenous person having to prove my goddamn pedigree to every person who says yeah, yeah, too yeah. white. I, the arcade. Here saying he's an arcade. I came from the video game arcade. I yeah, I came from the video game. I came from Street like, Fighter. Street Fighter. I, Fucking Mortal Kombat 2. I have to go around and tell people I'm black. I'm black, Bull, goddamn it. Bullshit, Herman Cain. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the ghost of Herman Cain. <laughs> Told me it ain't real, motherfucker. Told me it ain't real.
<laughs> but like for real, like Herman you're the Cain one who's the running guy, the Twitter right? account. Godfather's Pizza. Godfather's Pizza. Herman Cain was an honorary Italian because he he he, fi- he invented Godfather's Pizza. Oh my God. Herman Canianlo. <laughs> He's from Sicily. Hey, he, Herman Cain was from Sicily. You know what this reminds me of? <laughs> this reminds me of like all those white people that are like, guys, I'm I'm one twelfth Scottish and one fifth. Or like five percent. That's Italian. That's every white there. person. That's <laughs> every white person. I want to be a victim. Oh, oh, how much percentage of a victim can I be? Oh, exactly. Irish no, were slaves no, too, no. Y'all. The Irish were slaves and too. And be like, oh, guys, my grandfather was Mario. <laughs> yeah. Like so many, so many people think like because their ancestors were Irish. And because like 150 years ago, your Irish ancestors were oppressed. That doesn't mean you, as a one eighth Irish person, that does not mean you are oppressed. No Irish person in the United States of America. Okay, this is a PSA. No Irish person or no descendant of Irish people in the United in the Republic of the United States of America is oppressed. Get that through your heads. You are. Yeah. Not but we're not. Yes. Saying, we're, we're not. We're not, are- we're not saying they. We're not saying they shouldn't be though. We're not saying Listen, they shouldn't be. Flip that, but, make it no, a thing. Actually, they're, they're, all, not. they're all cops. I mean, how uh, can hold on. Uh, v, v and B aren't used to the Irish hate on the, We are officially, one, it, obviously they shit on me for being Italian-American, but uh, we are all in favor of shitting on the Irish because the Irish in Ireland, good. But somehow when they get across the Atlantic about halfway, probably where the Titanic sank, they just start becoming Klansmen and they want to be cops and they just discover racism and white supremacy. And it's just... Holy shit! It's like Boston turns in the fucking Alabama in the 1940s. Like that's what it is. Like I want to do the yes. like I want to do the ancestry thing, but I'm just so scared that I'm gonna get it back and like oh like you are a direct descendant of fucking Robert E. Lee. <laughs> <laughs> like you I'm were literally the like you of being white in America today. <laughs> but it's just fucking it's it's hard. It's so hard. It's hard out here for a white. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard out here for a simp. <laughs> yeah, no, there's an important distinction between like a member of the IRA, you know, in Ireland, and like Chad who gets drunk on St. Patrick's Day. Like, uh, there's a substantial yeah, difference. Yeah, there's a difference between the IRA um, and the NRA. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right? There you go. I think that's yeah, exactly. <laughs> The Irish and the IRA, good. The Irish and the KKK, bad. Um, hey, this, this thing of Oz. <laughs> this thing of Oz we got going here. So anyway, y'all, uh, before we wrap this up, BNV, thanks for coming on, y'all. Uh, any any last words, any last things? Uh, and then you don't want to plug anything and obviously send me whatever links you want and I can put them in the show notes. But before we go, any last words of advice to our listeners and us or anything you want to say before you plug your stuff? Um, yeah, I guess it sounds like, you know, any last words, we're not going to die. Um, uh, but I, I guess I would say that, I mean, first of all, thanks for having us on like this hour flew by. Um, I guess it's kind of obligatory to drop our Instagram. So follow us at, at Appalachian climate coalition, um, on Instagram, the youth wouldn't fit, uh, in the username, but we may change our name in the future, like really soon. So who, who, who knows what it'll be. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I just plug. wanted to say um, uh, I stand in solidarity with all Italian Americans. I do stand. Uh, you are not alone. You are not alone out there in in Jersey, in New York. Keep- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yo, y'all, my favorite guests. My favorite guests we've you. ever had. Stop. Fuck yeah! Get the fuck out of here! Hey, this thing of hey. ours. Oh, <laughs> Burgering your burgerias. Keep spaghetti in your spaghettiers. You you keep Italian. <laughs> my man, yes. <laughs> Hell yeah! Oh Yo, my god! Oh, I'm gonna tell god my damn. Italian mother about y'all, and she's gonna be your biggest fan. <laughs> They're such nice boys. They're such nice with the oh, organization god. and the thing. No. Did you get your shot? <laughs> yeah, she's gonna ask. You get she's your a shot? nurse, and she's gonna ask if you got your COVID vaccine yet. <laughs> oh my God! Anyway, y'all. But uh, B and V. That's not. That's like y'all should like do that. You should guys just should go by B and V anytime y'all are together. Just be like, hey, it's B and V. But uh, thanks for coming on, y'all. Really appreciate it. I'm gonna do this outro and uh, 
do all that good shit. So uh, at Dixieland and the Proletariat, we believe the South will rise again, but this time for the right reasons, those being worker-owned means of production, decolonization, and self-determination for all oppressed peoples. Make sure to like, follow, and subscribe to us on social media at Dixie Pro. We are coming to you from the birthplace of the civil rights movement, Montgomery, Alabama, as well as the United Kingdom. We'd also like to recognize we're recording on occupied land that rightfully belongs to the Muscogee Nation. BNV, thanks for showing up, y'all. And Tyler, you want to send us out? First, I want to say a very happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. And good Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. I'll see y'all next time. I want to say, hey, mom, I'm finally on Dixie Pro. You know, it's 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 the biggest accomplishment I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dixie Pro today, come town tomorrow. <laughs>